Understanding creation, how do dinosaurs fit in a biblical perspective? Um, we've been going through the book Understanding Creation for uh, the last uh, couple, three months. And um, it's uh, edited by James Gibson and, and Umberto Rossi. There are 20 chapters, and they're given as questions. If you want to think of it that way, they're frequently asked questions. They're, each one is attend, intended to be standalone although they do impinge on each other. Um, the original assignment was 1,800 to 2,400 words, and I think that uh, this chapter actually conforms to that. Uh, this week we're discussing how do dinosaurs fit in a biblical perspective, and uh, the chapter is written by Raul Esperante. Now, for those of you who don't know, Raul Esperante got a bachelor's degree in biology in Spain, where he grew up. He also worked as a science teacher in secondary school there and then moved to the United States and got a PhD in paleontology here at Loma Linda. He currently works as a paleontologist for the Geoscience Research Institute in California. His interests include the study of fossilization process, paleoecology, paleoenvironments, and issues related to science and faith. And I might say he knows as much about what fossil whales as anybody I know of. He has written several scholarly articles for peer-reviewed scientific journals, including they got on the cover of Geology, I think, once, and uh, participated in the scientific congresses in many countries. Um, to give you the kind of quick and dirty summary, uh, Raul argues for the existence of dinosaurs, which is pretty easy to do. He discusses the ambiguities surrounding their fit into the standard model, and then he discusses ambiguities that surround their fit into a creationist model. He discounts evidence for human-dinosaur interactions while leaving the door open. And uh, his presentation, in my opinion, raises a fascinating issue in the philosophy of science. And uh, uh, I'll mention that at the end. He starts out by talking about uh, natural history museums. If you've ever been in one, you've seen these spectacular dinosaur skeletons. TV documentaries also show us um, uh, lifelike animated dinosaur recreations. And of course, um, there are always the movies, um, Jurassic Park, where they come to life and do all kinds of things. Um, <coughs> paleontologists have found evidence of dinosaurs in sediments on every continent, even in Antarctica including bones, nests, eggs, and footprints. Especially abundant are dinosaur footprints and trackways found by the thousands in the US, Argentina, Spain, France, Russia, China, Mongolia, and Northern Africa, to name just a few of the more prominent locations. It seems that the dinosaurs existed on Earth for a limited period of time. In some places, they appear to have been numerous based on the number of bones and or footprints we have found. Now, he goes into uh, talking about dinosaurs in general. Um, obviously, you look at them, you can tell what uh, their size is. You can get a clue as to physiology, uh, likely social behavior, and probable habitats. But uh, a degree of uncertainty exists due to the interpretive nature of evidence. Although some dinosaurs were the largest terrestrial animals ever to live, Others were actually small, size of a sheep or a dog. And Struthymomimus was the size of an ostrich, and uh, Cosognathus was uh, no bigger than a rooster. Dinosaurs were apparently well adapted to their habitats, which include rivers, lake shores, beaches, forests, just about everything. It's important to be aware of a few things about the skeletons in museum displays. First, what we're seeing is typically not the actual bones, but replicas. Original bones are too valuable and delicate for display, so they're stored safely somewhere else in the museum. In addition, the complete display skeletons are often assembled from replicas of bones coming from more than one specimen. On occasion, these specimens are found in locations quite different from one another. Nevertheless, the 
Museum replicas are reasonably trustworthy. Some complete specimens have been unearthed, including Tyrannosaurus rex, exhibited in the Chicago field. So that one's actually one specimen. The animations seen on television, of course, are a little more imaginative because nobody has a clue as to what color the skin was, uh, and the physiology and behavior are, are purely speculative. According to the evolutionary viewpoint, dinosaurs originated from other animal ancestors through the gradual process of mutation and natural selection, or perhaps through the more rapid process of uh, uh, punctuated equilibrium. There remains in the geologic column appear in rock layers that paleontologists label Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, which according to the geologic time scale span 250 to 65 million years ago. Some paleontologists believe dinosaurs and other groups of plants and animals disappeared suddenly due to a gigantic meteorite impact at the close of the Cretaceous period some 65 million years ago. Uh, so there certainly was some kind of an impact there, and the best candidate for it is in the Yucatan. But others doubt this model, pointing to its inconsistencies, and he gives, uh, if you're interested in the discussion pro and con, uh, detailed and extensive discussion, see the debate held online at the Geological Society of London. And of course, since it's online, you can access it online, and he gives the uh, reference. Uh, the disappearance of dinosaurs isn't the only abrupt occurrence in the fossil record. They also make a sudden appearance. In other words, their fossils show up without any known ancestor or predecessor. And uh, I, he says the best paleontologists do is to speculate about which reptile group dinosaurs came from, but in terms of finding half turtles, half dinosaurs, or half uh, lizards, half dinosaurs, or uh, whatever group you think they might have come from, uh, uh, you're out of luck. And he says, see Benton and the, the references to a standard dinosaur book. This is not what we would expect in the gradual evolution model where different forms and complexes and groups of plants and animals allegedly evolved from less complex ancestors. In other words, if micro, macro evolution were true, then we would expect to see the gradual appearance of dinosaurs in the, in the record of fossils. Instead, we find the opposite, the appearance of fully formed, diversified dinosaurs demonstrating adaptation to their habitat. If you want to put it that way, there was a dinosaur explosion analogous to the Cambrian explosion. A disappearing act. Dinosaurs vanished from the fossil record worldwide at the topmost layer of the Cretaceous rock. A few paleontologists assert that birds are the descendants of dinosaurs. They base their conclusion on disputed feather impressions found on some fossil dinosaurs, as well as on bone features typical of birds that are found in other dinosaur fossils, and not the same ones. This controversial notion, based on a limited understanding of intermediate characteristics, fails to convincingly establish a bird, uh, dinosaur bird lineage and doesn't explain the lack of extant dinosaurs to date. In any case, the dinosaurs proper did disappear. Um, although there's some di dispute over whether they disappeared instantly at the time of the, uh, the iridium layer that marks the uh, meteorite impact or whether they um, had been disappearing for some time before that and this was kind of the coup de grace. As mentioned above, most evolutionary scientists claim that the dinosaur extinction resulted from a huge meteorite impact at the end of the Cretaceous period. And I'm told now that there's some dispute as a, that there may be more than one candidate for the actual meteorite. The Yucatan is not the only one. Such an impact would have released large amounts of dust and debris in the, into the atmosphere, blocking the sun and causing a global cooling of the Earth, um, somewhat like what we saw when Tambora exploded. Additionally, fire triggered by the fires triggered by the heat of the impact would have consumed many large forests around the planet, and dust and ash would have increased the toxicity of the air and water. The combination of cool temperatures and high environmental toxicity may have, might have triggered massive die-offs of dinosaurs and other organisms. However, this model faces tremendous scientific challenges. The sedimentary record of the Cretaceous layer and the rocks above um, I, there's a misprint there, and I'm not sure. I, it's probably mine. So no global 
extinction of fish, including sharks, nor of turtles, salamanders, frogs, and various groups of marine invertebrate organisms and plants. And again, he has a, a, another reference to the same book, actually. Um, how could dinosaurs go globally extinct and other groups of animals not? Frogs, salamanders, turtles, and many plants are very sensitive to alternation in climate. It seems unlikely they would have survived a radically changed post-impact climate on a global scale. And yet the dinosaurs die. Now, trying to fit it into a flood model, the long age evolutionary model faces many problems in explaining both the origin and the disappearance of dinosaurs. Is it possible to study dinosaurs and other fossils in a way that is consistent with the biblical model of creation? How do we interpret dinosaurs in a recent creation global flood framework? Were dinosaurs the result of millions of years of animal evolution, or were they God's creation? Or neither? These are important questions for the Bible believer because scripture affirms that God created the animal kingdom and that he declared his creation to be good. How do dinosaurs fit into the, in this picture? Most creationist scientists believe that dinosaurs disappeared together with many other species during the worldwide flood as described in Genesis 7.22. This scenario might also include meteorite activity resulting in giant tsunamis, volcanic activity, and emission of carbon dioxide, sulfides, and other chemicals harmful to plants and animals. Therefore, the idea of one or more meteorite impact, meteorites impacting the earth is not incompatible with the biblical model of the flood. In which case, we're talking about a, uh, <laughs> something far more than just water rising up and then going back down. In spite of a lack of consensus among scientists about what made dinosaurs disappear, the popular media, as well as some scientists, have decided that the meteor impact theory is the only valid explanation. However, this is far from reality. Dinosaurs didn't, uh, did disappear, but we don't know precisely when or why. Their extinction during the Genesis flood, with or without an associated impact, is a plausible hi hypothesis deserving our consideration. In fact, some evidence is consistent with this hypothesis. Often, dinosaur remains are found in massive burials consisting of ten tens to thousands of individuals, including young and adults, buried together. And um, According to Art Chadwick, in some cases, it is obvious that their, that their burial was done with water sorting, with the heaviest bones on the bottom and the lighter bones tend to, tending to be up towards the top. Example of dinosaur graveyards occurred in western U.S., Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming, Canada, Spain, China, Mongolia, and other places. Scientists have explained some of these massive occurrences as a result of a local catastrophe, for example, a mudslide, local flood, dune collapse. But they could instead be explained as a result of local ge geologic activity during a worldwide flood, such as the one described in Genesis. And he does have some more references to the standard literature. Um, do dinosaurs make sense in a biblical creation? The study of the, both the origin and extinctions of dinosaurs can be approached within a biblical worldview framework. The book of Genesis says that on the sixth day of creation week, God created livestock, creatures that moved along the ground, and wild animals according to, each according to its kind. This group of creatures might well have included dinosaurs, and to all the beasts of the earth, uh, and all the birds of the air, and all the creatures that moved on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, uh, stated God. And again, a couple of typos for which I apologize. But where do carnivorous dinosaurs fit in this perfect all-vegetarian world? The biblical account suggests that the divine curse following Adam and Eve's fall triggered some biological, that is genetic, modif modifications that originated changes in the diet of some animals and brought about competition, predation, disease, and perhaps parasitism, most likely over the span of several generations. Is this possible? Recent research in genetics has shown how major physiological and even anatomical changes can occur by a slight modification in the regulatory activity of regulatory genes. And he has a site there, um, actually a couple of them. 
dinosaurs and human beings. Much has been written and argued regarding evidence that supposedly shows dinosaur and human coexistence. The evidence includes what are interpreted to be human footsteps together with dinosaur footprints, as well as prehistoric pictures in caves and on pottery where human figures appear with exceptional creatures very similar to current reconstructions of these giant reptiles. However, rigorous scientific study by creationist scientists has shown that these features have been misinterpreted. Now, keep that thought in mind. Let us analyze, for example, and this is the one they always go to, the alleged human and dinosaur prints found in the riverbed of the Polixi River in Texas. A few decades ago, some enthusiastic scientists proclaimed this constituted evidence prov proving the existence of a worldwide flood. Intrigued by these statements, more than one evolutionist and creationist scientist studied in detail the marks found on the rocks. Laboratory studies were carried out by creationist scientists. An authentic print should present a deformation in the sediment under the print, which is normally left as a result of the animal's weight. You've got strata, the foot pushes down and the strata bend underneath the foot. To test for this characteristic deformation, scientists cut the print crosswise and observed no such deformation was present. They concluded that the shape was not a real human footprint, but instead a pseudoprint resulting from erosion. And uh, as Art Chadwick's uh, article in Origins is cited there. Some people believe that certain prints and drawings probably had been fab fabricated to appear human-like. And that's always a possibility. Uncritical use of poorly supported arguments harms to research being conducted by creationist scientists. Most of these researchers have learned to be more careful and accurate in their statements. And I think that that's one thing that when we make statements about this, we should be very careful and also accurate. Dinosaurs in the Bible. The story of creation in Genesis 1 tells of a God who created sea life as well as birds on the fifth day and the rest of the animals on the sixth day. Although reptiles are included among the animals created, dinosaurs are not specifically mentioned. Moses, who authored the book of Genesis, would not have had a specific word to refer to the dinosaur, nor was it necessary for him to mention them specifically in his narrative. After all, he didn't mention many other groups of animals, for example, beetles, sharks, or starfish that God created. Some find dinosaurs too strange or ugly to be part of God's creation. Currently there are many animals just uh, as strange in appearance as dinosaurs that don't draw that much attention. Others believe the dinosaurs appeared to the as a result of the curse after Adam and Eve's sin, but the Bible does not identify which animals changed as a result of sin or what kinds of changes might have occurred. Most creationist scientists believe dinosaurs disappeared during or shortly after the Genesis flood. However, the Bible does not specify the fate of these animals. The idea that dinosaurs disappeared during the worldwide catastrophe we call the flood is a hypothesis we should seriously consider, but only thorough, only through scientific research, since the Bible is silent on the matter. The demonstration of this hypothesis should come from geological and paleontological data, but not from reading our ideas into the Bible. Some creationists have suggested the dinosaurs might have been preserved in the ark, survived the flood, and disappeared shortly after, while unsuccessfully attempting to adjust to a greatly changed environment. This is also a possibility, since perhaps some of the dinosaurs were inside the ark and afterward uh, afterwards disappeared during the post-Diluvian colonization. The Bible mentions two strange creatures, Behemoth in Job 40, 15 through 18, and Leviathan in Job 41, 1, which some interpret as possible examples of post-Diluvian dinosaurs. However, most Bible scholars do not accept this explanation, and the word Behemoth and Leviathan are usually translated as hippopotamus and crocodile, respectively. Just my own passing comment on that. Most Bible scholars do not accept this explanation. I think some because they're uncomfortable with the, uh, with the answer that might be given. Um, so I, I don't put that much weight on the majority of Bible scholars in that particular regard. 
It depends on the reasons they're using. Uh, scripture does not mention the existence of dinosaurs, at least not as we now identify them, neither before nor after the Genesis flood. Of course, the fact that the Bible doesn't mention dinosaurs doesn't constitute evidence that they never existed. It is simply another topic, among others, about which the Bible says nothing, providing us with fascinating questions to pursue. The physical evidence pointing to their existence is clear. We have found dinosaur bones, teeth, eggs, footprints, and even impressions of their skin. At some point in history, they disappeared. Their extinction may have taken place before, during, or even after the Genesis flood. Like the rest of the fossils, the origin and disappearance of dinosaurs are wrapped in mystery. However, dinosaurs do not challenge or compromise our faith in the Bible's teaching. They require careful and rigorous study, something Christians with the interest and talent should be strongly encouraged to do. Now, my own take on that article. First, I, I like his take on dinosaurs for the most part, and even the criticism I would make is tempered. Um, his caution on dinosaur-human interactions is understandable and warranted, given his position. Um, he has interactions with uh, uh, other people. And uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, if he were to uh, advocate an outlandish, even if true, position, it would take away from his ability to do other things that he's doing. And I, I think that uh, we need to always be careful about that because even if you're right, but uh, you're saying something that is, sounds so totally wild and erroneous that, uh, that you give people the excuse to toss you off for no good reason, um, one needs to be careful not to take a stand on that unless it's absolutely warranted. And certainly the dinosaur evidence isn't strong enough to make that. Um, having said that, I, it may true, be true that he proves too cautious in the long run. He starts from what I consider the worst case, the Polixi footprints, where one can demonstrate that the, some of them are not really footprints. Um, and that some of them appear to be flat out carved uh, non-footprints, which makes the very worst case. Um, to point out the problem we have, I, I'm going to start with a, another place where it's pretty indisputable that uh, that there is, in fact, evidence out there. It's a question of uh, what you do with it, and that's uh, in Angkor Wat. Uh, some of you may have seen this little thing. If you look at it, it um, kind of brings to mind uh, Stegosaurus. Now, it doesn't look exactly like what we conceive Stegosaurus to be right now. And it's probably, in that sense, an error. For one thing, it's got a little bigger head than you'd expect. For another thing, it's got legs that are roughly equal size. And uh, for another thing, it's missing the uh, terminal spikes. Uh, this is more like what we would conceive of Stegosaurus being. But the plates down the back are rather striking, and the arched back. Um, and, uh, it, you know, uh, if you allow a little bit for the artistic license, this is somebody that's saying, well, he's got, this one's got plates too, but I, and not quite the same. Um, if, uh, if we go back to the uh, original, you can see that they're pretty regular and they're stuck right to this critter. Um, uh, if, uh, the tail end is often called a thagomizer in honor of uh, Gary Larson. Am I in your, in your way to see? There you go. Pardon me? 
I guess. <laughs> At least in Gary Larson's world. It's interesting because Gary Larson said he needs to go to a f confessional where he says, Father, I have sinned and put humans and dinosaurs together. But <laughs> anyway, um, whoa, that was a little fast. I don't know what happened there. That was, uh, let's do it that way. Okay, uh, hopefully it won't keep going, yeah. The, one of the questions is, what counts for evidence? Is that evidence? Or is that really a hippopotamus or a, um, uh, or a rhinoceros that somebody put plates on? Um, or is that really a chameleon? Um, or are these all attempts to avoid the obvious? Um, Maybe what actually happened is that the person who made this thing didn't actually see one, but he was carrying down an old oral tradition that had by this time dropped the, uh, uh, the thagomizer and had the plates, uh, uh, he had forgotten that the plates are in two rows. Um, and. Uh, Uh, the one thing I can say is that this is not a recent forgery because I think if it had been a recent forgery, uh, it would have been done a little better. Um, but, uh, and, and then that, bring, that brings out the second question is supposing that if we're playing it straight down the middle, we decide that that is really a stegosaurus and it was evidence that some humans had seen one. Well, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was that they'd seen the... Um, the bones somewhere. Uh, the problem is that there aren't too many uh, stegosaurs in that part of the world. They're mostly New World, uh, and there's one in Portugal, but not, uh, not in other places. Um, and, and then one of the things that you run into, if you, if you read, um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name now. Uh, I think it's uh, Geo Christian or something like that that uh, had a website that had all this stuff. And he was uh, outlining how, why he didn't think that was stegosaurus. And you realize that, you know, nothing's really going to count because they know it can't be unless you can show that there's a naturalistic explanation for it. Um, and this, this brings up, I mean, what, what do you do with somebody who says there's a 28 uh, million year old Guatemalan uh, limestone that contains a female human uh, 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 skeleton in it? Pretty well documented that there's something there, but there's got to be some mistake. Um, when you realize that scientific theories are not usually done away with by a single anomaly, that it has to be something where a lot of things don't fit. I think uh, at least my, uh, my approach would be not to use this in a strong argument. It would be rather to use this as a weak argument and let them stew over it for a while. Um, I think that one of the problems with science is that there's a subtle bias and it goes kind of like this. Science is intended to be an objective thing. That's what makes it better than all other human knowledge, is that it doesn't matter what your religion or your culture or anything like that is. You all come to it with, uh, with your biases, but the evidence kind of straightens you out. And so all reasonable people can agree on what science really is. Well, that includes, of course, reasonable atheists. And we're reasonable atheists, which means that, therefore, we don't agree with it. It doesn't really count. It isn't science. And I think we have to face that kind of, uh, and it's one reason why I think that even silver bullets, even if they existed, would not be acknowledged. 
And uh, with that, I will leave the discussion of dinosaurs to uh, the rest of you. Comments? Questions? Well, uh, nobody else wants to say anything. Uh, I, th I think the presentation was, was Raoul's presentation was very good, and uh, the question you raised at the end is also uh, very good. The uh, thing that comes to my mind, of course, is uh, we tend to say, well, science, so many scientists agree, uh, and therefore we, uh, it's got to be close to truth because scientists, you know, just look at objective data and, and all this uh, type of thing. But when uh, we look at religion, for instance, can't we say to a certain extent the same thing, that so many Christians believe the Bible? And uh, uh, in other words, the popularity argument uh, could be a dangerous one. And uh, we need to be cautious about that. And I feel more comfortable, and I hope I don't get in trouble, I feel more comfortable starting from a more objective, the more objective data uh, to get to the reason why I believe the Bible. I feel more comfortable in the argument, well, you know, uh, life can't originate by itself. It's obvious because of my empirical science. And to go from that step to, well, uh, if there is a God, and once you put God in the picture, the picture changes dramatically. Once you put God in there, then, of course, you uh, expect some communication from him. And I'd pick the Bible as uh, more likely communication from him than any other of the uh, sources, it would be the Indian Vedas or the... Uh, writings of Buddha or whatever you want to go. So I, uh, uh, I'm i no more comfortable with that. That's a little different from uh, uh, what you were uh, discussing here, but it's it's uh, an ID. I, I would add to this thing, uh, probably dinosaur eggs are allowed to come up in the discussion sooner or later. And of course, he, knowing how brief we had to write these chapters, I uh, probably couldn't cover everything. Uh, the distribution of dinosaur eggs does not work out very well uh, in connection with the distribution of dinosaurs because you, you find the eggs mostly in the upper part of the Cretaceous. Uh, After the dinosaurs have already made their appearance? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, parallel uh, well the presence of skeletons, uh, which is an interesting little sidelight I would throw on the thing and so on. Well, anyway, uh, I'm sure somebody else wants to uh, uh, discuss this intriguing issue. I presume predation will come up sooner or later. Well, wouldn't you expect the eggs to be placed in nests where they are considered to be relatively safe? Every creature puts a nest where they think is relatively safe. It would tend to be on high ground. And if the bones are buried, they're going to be washed down to some low ground someplace. So uh, what, what you've just observed would tend to be consistent with that kind of scenario. Well, there, there are a couple of things um, that have to be considered in this. One of them is uh, there is more or less evidence for a nest as well as a, a eggs, not, not completely. And it would be interesting to see whether the eggs inside of nests tend to be higher or lower than the eggs outside of nests. So that might 
uh, that might answer a few questions. If the, if the eggs outside of nests tend to be higher, then you might be dealing with some kind of a flotation effect. I would urge a little bit of caution uh, with nests. Uh, what, how does a dinosaur build a nest? You know, we bird nests we can tell quite easily because it's built of branches and so on. A dinosaur supposedly builds his nest out of dirt and it's in dirt. And uh, some scholars have questioned, you know, whether all these nests are really nests. You find uh, one egg, it's not a nest. You find two eggs, it's a nest. Uh, and uh, now, there are some that are oriented, uh, a group. I think there's no question that that could be a, a nest. Uh, but uh, the term dinosaur nest is, uh, it needs to be worked on. Uh, uh, this, this is not something that uh, is easily identified at all. Well, it's a little bit like what we see at Anchor Wat. It's, you know, it's partly in the eye of the beholder what you, what you see. I don't think it's completely, because everybody who looks at that is struck by what it looks like. And then has to try to figure out how to explain it as either something else or accept it as, as, uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a poor copy, because it's definitely not a really great copy of a uh, stegosaurus. So I think we have one here and then one there. Apparently it's easy for us today to breed different kinds of dogs, smart as we are. We're told that before the flood, people were perhaps smarter than we are. They lived a long time. They got up to a great deal of mischief. One of the theories is that these madmen, these scientists, did a little bit of genetic experimenting, came up with the dinosaurs. Maybe even the devil had a hand in it. What do you think about those theories? Uh, it's an interesting question, and it has if if it is true, it has particular relevance to today because we are now getting into the point where we can do things like genetic engineering, and it raises very interesting questions of what we're doing with that and how and why, um, and uh, we'll see if that topic comes up. Uh, Steve, and then uh, we have a comment down here. The, the, the Anger Watt image um, reminds me of uh, an old documentary I remember seeing as a teenager, I think it was In Search of Ancient Astronauts, in which they showed carvings like that in which they, you know, interpreted as pictures of people inside spaceships, you know, operating controls and stuff like that. So, you know, it, 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 you, ha you have to be, you have to look at it carefully, like you say. And I, I was also wondering how, if, if we have these, these, uh, um, uh, all these uh, nests, dinosaur nests that are in these intermediate layers of the geologic column, and we're, trying to interpret the entire geologic column as resulting from a single flood. How did they survive undisturbed like that when you've got mixing from below and above, apparently? I, I don't understand that. The uh, uh, proposal I gather from Raoul's chapter is that dinosaurs or their predecessors were created as vegetarian. Because that's what it sounds like. Yeah. And, and that's certainly the easiest proposal to make from a theological point of view. Otherwise, we've got real problems, I guess, because we've got death before sin. In, in terms of the uh, present consensus among Adventist scientists, there are two versions of evolution. I think everyone accepts that microevolution occurs. And um, macroevolution as a concept is frowned upon. The division between what's micro and what's macro varies depending upon who's giving the definition. This transformation from a vegetarian dinosaur to something like Tyrannosaurus rex 
by definition, would have to fit into the, the microevolution category. Am I correct in that? Well, there, there are a couple of other odd things that um, uh, it's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm uh, reluctant to, to uh, say that it can be only micro. But once we go into macro, then uh, aren't we heading down the slippery slope? Well, here's, here, here is a case that can be made. And that is that uh, in the biblical record, it talks about all flesh has corrupted itself. And that almost implies that the animals are involved too. Uh, because, all, because he's going to destroy all flesh. And presumably he's going to keep in the ark what he wants and then leave the rest of it out. How do animals corrupt themselves? Um, it's interesting that the word that is used there is a word that's familiar to most of us. Um, it's Hamas, it's violence. And of course, those of you who are familiar with Middle Eastern uh, terms know where Hamas crops up again. And uh, so it suggests that one of the things that is corrupting is in fact animals that commit violence against other animals, or perhaps against people. In addition to that, there are some very odd things in nature today. Uh, the platypus was first thought to be a joke. And it was thought to be a joke because it had the bill of a duck, and it had uh, web feet of a duck, and it had fur like a mammal, and it laid eggs like a reptile, and uh, you know, it's just all mixed up. Well, it turns out that its genome is also all mixed up. And it raises a very interesting question of whether some large-scale genetic projects had been uh, made. And so uh, that, of course, would not be evolution. It would be intelligent design, uh, perhaps malevolent intelligent design, certainly, if not malevolent, at least incompetent, but intelligent design nevertheless. And so you would not be talking about undirected evolution, the classic evolution, what is usually meant in the textbooks. And it is possible that that kind of process might have produced uh, what would now be classified as an entirely different family. So is it... Has it, has it slopped over from micro into macro? I suppose in one sense it has. It, it, the, only, the only sense that it hasn't is that it's not undirected. But directed macroevolution is a category that we have tended to shy away from because I think that that's theistic evolution. And what you're proposing would be devilistic or something similar to that. Yeah. Do we know the limits of, do we know the limits of adaptation? Or has that been, have we discussed that enough to have a clear idea on that? So that, would, that might be a good topic to pursue. Uh, I don't know that we, uh, well actually uh, Michael Behe pursued the edge of evolution trying to find out how fast you could expect it to, to develop something. And it does turn out to be pretty much inadequate to explain what we've got. Um, but of course, that's talking about undirected evolution. When you start talking about directed evolution, then um, theoretically, a lot of things are possible. And of course, theoretically, if you've got God directing it, virtually anything is possible. Because if God wants to monkey with the genome, he can do it and, and create whatever he wants to. And 
make everything go in one giant step. And then you're talking about creating hopeful, hopeful monsters, as, as uh, Goldblatt would say. The, um, this, this paper here is interesting in that it would have been unacceptable in an Adventist book 45 or 50 years ago. I um, had the privilege of going on a geoscience field trip with F.D. Nickel. And uh, as many of you here know, F.D. Nickel, um, as a young minister, debated with famous evolutionists. And uh, one of those debates, at least, the one that was held in Chicago, uh, was eventually published. And even as late as this would have been the mid-60s, um, F.D. Nickel, who at that time was the editor of the Review and Herald, did not believe in the existence of dinosaurs. He, he believed, as most Adventists did in the 50s, that they were cre creation of paleontologists who took a bone from here and a rib from there and created these creatures. And we had visited that day a very interesting um, coal mine in which there were dinosaur footprints on the top of the seam of the coal. So when the coal had been removed, you could walk through the mine shaft and see these footprints. They're, they're actually casts. They're casts, down. yeah. And these were clearly four-footed dinosaurs, um, and there were small ones following them. And uh, there was the cast of a, the roots of a tree also coming down into the ceiling of the coal mine. And the dinosaurs, as they moved along, had reared up on their hind legs because the, there was now only a pair of footprints. And they were presumably eating from the trees. They were probably duckbill dinosaurs or some, some similar creatures. And then they flopped down again, and you could see the four-footed tracks. Uh, presumably, when this was happening, the front feet were smaller than the... Yeah. Hind feet. Yeah. And the hind feet, you could see how, how deep the, the uh, footprints had gone, sort of the way Raoul had discussed the, the problems with the Paluxy riverbed footprints. So we followed these trackways. They walked <laughs> right along the top of this coal seam, and it, it looked for all the world as if any moment they would break through the ceiling and fall in front of us, and, and uh, we'd be privileged to see a living dinosaur for the first time. And, however long it's been since they've been dead. Anyway, we emerged from this. We were blinking in the sunlight as we came out. And he turned to me and he said, Brian, there really were dinosaurs, weren't there? <laughs> and it was obvious that this is the first time that he had faced the, the evidence that um, Raoul talks about here and had come to accept in, that, in the previous hour that dinosaurs really had existed. This was in the 60s. Well, I think that it's important for us to keep in mind, uh, you know, sometimes some of the stuff that, they're, that these people write for don't apply to me personally or to most of the people I know of because we've long since come to peace with this. But I think there is a sizable group of people out there that think that the geologic column is a bunch of hooey and think that the dinosaurs were, uh, you know, fakes made up by people who wanted to well, this was very standard when I was um, in high school and college. And, you know, to be fair, I think, that, uh, I think that it's a good change in the community to where these things are at least not major issues for most of us. And I think, but I think that it's good for him to address that right up front uh, because I think that that's really important uh, for us to kind of get the record straight for some creationists as well as for evolutionists or people who are considering both. Now we got all kinds of hands. I think that um, uh, Danilo is first and it's his birthday anyway, so. Um. I think it is a mistake to hammer everything into either micro or macro evolution. Uh, by, by applying labels to things, we sometimes think we understand more when in fact we may understand less. Example, we now know a lot of examples of transgenic uh, plants, vegetables, fruits, all kinds of things like this. I have never once ever heard 
from anyone, atheist or Christian, using that as examples of evolution, micro or macro. Why is that? Uh, it's because the creationists aren't imaginative enough. Because <laughs> I've used it. You see, I, see I the, the problem with that issue is once you have somebody deliberately crafting things, how on earth are you even going to use the word evolution in it? Does it make any sense? Well, well this is in fact one of my, uh, one of my discussions. Uh, um, Provine has a partner that used to teach a uh, evolution class. Is, was he at Cornell as well? Will Provine? There's a, one of those. I believe it was Cornell. So it's the same place at Sanford and, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm blanking on the guy's name. Uh, Cornell, and he had a, he had a guy that, that he taught with. And uh, that guy used to every once in a while visit the uh, uh, under, uh, uncommon descent blogs. And uh, he had 47 different ways that evolution could happen. Uh, not counting, and I think it's now up to 52 or whatever. Uh, not counting the standard, you know, mutation uh, uh, scenario. So it's a lot of these were epigenetic kinds of things. And so I asked him, well, what do you do with, uh, you know, we've taken the gene for blue pigment and put it into roses. Right. And supposing that somebody does that out in Madagascar somewhere, grows a garden with one of those things in it. And then a nuclear war wipes out humankind. But somehow the rose is spared and a few other plants. And aliens come to our, 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 uh, our pla uh, planet and start looking to see what kind of uh, evidence there is for evolution. And they find this rose that suddenly out pops this gene uh, for blue color. What are they to make of the origin of that gene? Um, isn't intelligent design a possibility for the change of uh, for the change of genomic material, and specifically adding genomic material to a a plant? And um, at that point, he kind of clammed up and didn't say anything. Uh, I was really kind of disappointed because I would have liked to have seen him address the question. Uh, because it seems to me that, that if there is such a thing as intelligent design, and I think it's indisputable now that there is, if we can design bacteria that produce insulin or you know, yeast that puts out TPA, um, that's intelligent design. And of interest, intelligent design in that sense tends to favor some organism other than the organism that's actually getting this stuff. So that's kind of an interesting point in and of itself. So if you find things in nature that favor some other animal other than the animal or some other plant other than um, then you, you have to ask the question, well, maybe this is intelligent design. And then, of course, once intelligent design is accepted, then at that point you just simply have to ask, well, uh, was this a human or other? If it's other, how did it uh, exist? Um, and if it's uh, fairly quickly, you come back to the question of, uh, was there a supernatural designer? Which is why this is always avoided. And it's why they always want to jump to, well, who designed the designer? Because they're trying to get the religious question answered before they get the scientific one answered. That way they can dictate the results of the scientific question. Um, and then the only real question after that from a theological point of view is how long did it take? And of course, as we all know, it doesn't take very long for human intelligent designers to change a genome. Well, maybe a matter of a year or two, but not, certainly not 
uh, hundreds of millions of years. <coughs> Anyway, we had yeah, another. A couple of things. Number one, there's a Dr. Baugh who spent many years uh, studying the Pulaski River findings. Is this all a box? That's number one. Number two, uh, in the 1970s, the Japanese fishermen caught a sea monster that was decaying, and uh, some of you folks remember that picture. And it looked so much like the, to me, like the uh, dinosaur in the field museum in Chicago, if you put flesh on it. But as I remember, this was one of, one of the seagoing dinosaurs, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it yeah. looked very convincing. Any thoughts in this field? Uh, well, oh, it, it, was, it was big news at the time. There was, the, there was this, the, this uh, they caught this thing. And they, unfortunately, it's too bad they didn't like freeze it in something, and then we could have done DNA analysis on it now and, and uh, uh, gotten some hopefully very interesting results. But as we know now, you can get a considerable amount of DNA, DNA out of a half rotted. And, and, but, but see, here's the, here's the problem with those is that if you know that uh, the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, then it just can't be a dinosaur. It's got to be something else. And then you don't even ask those questions. Or if you do ask them, you ask them in a way that, that helps you to be able to prove that you don't. Um, it's, it's very interesting. They're, right now they're pursuing legends in the Congo of these creatures that are supposed to look like dinosaurs. Are the pygmies picking up on what the white man wants? Um, or is, this, is there some kind of critter out there that they can't find? It, it, there have been expeditions to try to find them. Uh, as far as I know, they've always come out empty-handed. Um, you know, how much weight do you put on that kind of stuff? Yeah, well, the, the Paluxy Riverbed, the problem, that, the problem that I have with it is there are known frauds. There are really nice carved footprints. I mean, they're, they're five toes and, you know, they're obviously human. Uh, but when you look at them, the, the, uh, the, the stone layers, uh, the uh, uh, strata go straight through without dipping down under like they would for a normal footprint. Um, now, here's, here's the thing. There may be real human footprints there. But because there are frauds, you're not going to be able to make a really good case for them because from somebody who doesn't want to believe, it's really easy to just say, well, that's another fraud. Uh, and they won't even bother to say, but this one we should saw through and see whether the, whether the layers do dip down. They do, by the way, dip down under the dinosaur footprints. And that's one of the reasons why we know that the dinosaur footprints are in fact real. Maybe they were heavier. Well, you know, this, this, the whole thing ended after a flash flood case and watched up the and and, and Yeah, but, but see, the, the problem, and this is, this is a problem that I, I would criticize Carl Baugh for, <laughs> is he needs to be really careful to ask it from the most skeptical point of view that you, that you can make and to, and to start you know, he needs to take out the human footprints and, and saw them in half, the ones that he thinks they are, and see whether, in fact, they do dip down and see how impressive they are. If you've got this little blob and it dips down, you're going to have a harder time making your case <laughs> than, if you have a, uh, than if you have a five-toed thing. But uh, if, if you have five toes, you're going to you're gonna have to show that it's not fraud because we know that exists. And this is the kind of work that, to my knowledge, has not been done. When it's done, it will be much more impressive, although there will still be the little cloud of, uh, that I don't think will ever completely dissipate. Uh, it will always make a cheap and easy way of getting rid of that kind of data. And that's one of the reasons why I don't use it, even though it is possible that there may be some actual good data there. 
the problem is that because of because of the uh, known fraud around it, that it's useless as evidence. It's very much like if you're in court and they ask you your opinion. Uh, they ask you what happened in a, in, during a certain time, that you can give nice detailed instructions. If they ever catch you once telling a lie, then you might as well not have testified. Even if you're telling the absolute God honest truth. And, and this is the kind of thing that happens, and that's why creationists need to be really, really careful. Never ever to commit fraud and to be as careful as possible with the evidence itself so that we don't find, uh, find ourselves being discredited because we, didn't really, uh, because we didn't really deal with all of the information that was there. Or we, we, if we deal with it dishonestly in one place, everything else that we say gets discredited. It may not be fair, but it's life and it's one of the things we have to deal with. Um, we have. He was next. Uh, comment. The Do you have the mic? Just, sure just a minute. Uh, we want. We want to catch you for posterity here. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair to those that didn't believe there were dinosaurs, etc., the reverse is also true. There have been enough hoaxes in in the name of finding transitional humans, etc., uh, like the Nebraska family, etc., that a healthy skepticism in reverse was understandable. Uh, throughout time if people don't look carefully at the evidence because it certainly is played back the other way over and over again where great claims are made for things off of very poor evidence and there were whole skeletons and skins and lifestyles etc of things generated off of very limited evidence so there was grounds for the skeptics to point the finger back the other way and I think that you're right too and that means that people who are on the other side really have an obligation to be really critical about their own evidence um, I think, uh, fortunately, I think that the most, the most of the days of Nebraska man are dead. Um, Piltdown man is, uh, although we still get Ida, uh, the little, uh, uh, yeah, but it was, it, was, it was hyped way beyond what was really necessary. And we still have the uh, half dinosaur, half bird, where they, uh, I'm trying to think of what the name of that critter was that uh, the National Geographic fell for. Archaeoraptor. Uh, so it's, you know, uh, these kinds of things happen on both sides. And so, you, you, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not fair to just say, well, the creationists are to blame because, uh, both both sides have done it, and and it's not good for either side. Yes. Well, as as somebody said, there's some people that if they tell you the sky is blue, you peek outside. <laughs> uh, there's a certain amount of self-correction on both sides, just as there are frauds on both sides. Um, Self-correction takes a long, long time. As a librarian, I like to track the kind of the history of ideas and how they get reshaped and retooled and so on. And that's certainly true of Paluxy. I was there in 1976 with the geoscience tour. I don't know, are you? I think you were there on that tour, 1976, five-week geoscience tour. We started in Texas in the heat of the Texan summer. I actually have a uh, photograph in my collection of a dinosaur print, and next to it is Robert Brown's uh, bare footprint because we took our shoes off to wade across the river. So I have <laughs> for posterity, and he's been a member of our class, Robert Brown, so we do miss him, certainly. Um, what happened since 1976 is they did have new flooding, and new layers were uncovered, and people kept going back. And where they had a trackway, and it looked like giant human tracks, 18, 17, 18 inches long, they thought they had a human trackway with more than one track. 
in the further end where it was being uncovered, they found the three toe marks of a tridactyl dinosaur. So obviously, if you have dinosaur at one end of the trackway, and it's the same trackway, what was told to us in 1976 were 18-inch human tracks where the um, footprints of dinosaurs, and it just took a little more erosion. The other thing about doing scientific... Well, actually, what it was is a, it was a werewolf. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so what, what uh, it takes is some new research, but mm -hmm. keep in mind, this area, most of the track sites are protected by a state park now. So it's protected land, and there are a few tracks on private, but not too many. I could add just a little bit to this history. Of course, I, I remember being with Brian Bull and F.D. Nickel on that trip, and uh, this is all uh, so interesting to me. But uh, getting to your comments specifically, uh, uh, the Geoscience Research Institute let out in this question about these tracks. We published the article in Origins about it, and I recommend this to, to all of you. Which I think it's the one that's referenced by Raoul. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Um, where they it where they sliced uh, they sliced these tracks. These tracks were yeah. at Chadwick uh, and Newfeld did it, and yeah, Chadwick, Chadwick wrote it up, I think. Uh, the, the tracks were they purchased. See, Washington Missionary College purchased, uh, and I don't remember the price. I think thousand dollars for for a pair of tracks from Paloxy River. Those are the ones we sliced. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, published about them. Okay. Now, th there was a film out, I believe it's called Footprints in Stone, that uh, outlined the idea that man and dinosaur lived together there. And they had uh, outlined the human aspect by using oil and uh, this they were criticized for this and uh, so on and uh, that film was withdrawn yes the creationists who had produced the film after we had put it they withdrew that because they felt the the data there in uh, Biloxi was uh, being questioned by other creationists like us uh, and so uh, that went on, but Carl Baugh, he, he doesn't go along with it. He, no. he Yeah, he, Carl Baugh is, is still, uh, and, and there is a school of debate that says you never admit you're wrong, because as soon as you do, they'll use it against you. Well, there's also, there's an economic interest. Carl Baugh has a museum down there, and he wants to generate a little bit of controversy, and he gets more people coming to his museum. I know I'm probably putting uh, a motive on him that uh, maybe is unfair, but uh, it's true. Once you take a position like he has, it's very hard to retract. Uh, it was Clifford Burdock who once was studying for a doctor at University of Arizona in geology, would have been our first Adventist geologist trained at the highest level. Uh, he's the one that got a hold of these tracks and publicized the man-made tracks that were at uh, Columbia Union College. It's true, they were deposited there. I've seen them in, in their little museum there. And he took pictures, and those photographs are in Whitcomb and Morris's book, The Genesis Flood. And they have never, they, there's a new edition of that book done by someone else, but the old edition never uh, took the pictures of the tracks out, even though they were recanted and so on. So there's a long tradition. It's hard to change traditions when you start going a certain direction. Well, it, the thing of it is, in order to change the, uh, the tracks of, of, of that particular book, you'd have to give a whole new edition. You, you would, would want to go through and re-edit the whole thing. And you would have to acknowledge, make some acknowledgments maybe, too, along yeah. the way. You, and you would, and you'd have to... Uh, do some explaining. Uh, you know, you can reproduce the original just because it has historical value, yeah. regardless of, of what else is going on. Um, uh, but 
but you're but you're right it's it's hard to take all of the errors out of a book yeah and um, especially when you know that you didn't actually take all the errors out anyway you just took all the errors you knew about and um, <laughs> you got the job all over again the, the new edition does not have a dr. Andrew Snelling um, very qualified eminent creationist geologist has a two volume work now came out a couple years ago and yeah. it's a revision of Whitcomb and Morris yeah and but he doesn't even deal with that s well maybe he does deal with the subject of the tracks I don't know I got Texas. about three quarters of the way through and then lost the uh, ability to, to f keep going on it so I, I, I'll have to go back and look at it again I'll have to look at it again I've scanned through the whole book uh, Earth's Catastrophic Past by Andrew Snelling, S-N-E-L-L-I-N-G. It's two volumes. Uh, when I bought it, it was $60. You might be able to get it cheaper through Amazon. But it's, it is the definitive book now from a creationist standpoint of geology, at least outside of uh, yeah. our own circles. We have some excellent books, too. And an well, excellent um, author here. Too. Yeah. Thank you all for coming and um, next week we're looking forward to Brian Bull and the route of the exodus and why there's so much confusion and uh, uh, what uh, possibilities I guess have been thrown up and 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 uh, what's the evidence behind them and against them and it's going to be fun. <laughs>